Luke chapter 9, uh, starting in verse 51. We're starting a new series this morning called On the Way to Jerusalem. And this is a series that's going to carry us all the way through Easter. And the title comes from the fact that as early as Luke chapter 9, you begin to hear about things that Jesus did on the way to Jerusalem. Which is interesting to me because Luke has 24 chapters, and we all know what happens in Jerusalem. But that means that with about two-thirds of the gospel to go, Luke begins looking towards the end of Jesus' life. And you start to realize how much Jesus did on the way to Jerusalem and how much he did in the context of knowing what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. And so for the next several weeks, again going up to Easter, we're going to be looking at those passages in Luke that talk about the things that Jesus did on his way to Jerusalem and the difference uh, that that made. So if you have your Bibles, um, Luke chapter 9, verse 51, and I'm going to ask you if you are physically able, uh, if you would stand in honor of the reading of God's word as we get into the scripture this morning. Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse uh, 51. As the time approached for him, Jesus, to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went to another village. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Would you pray with me? Almighty God, what we know not, please teach us. What we have not, please give us. And what we are not, please make us. As we uh, look into your perfect, inerrant, infallible word, let us receive the message that you would have for us this morning. I pray that the speaker would be forgotten, and I pray that the only thing that is remembered are those things that you place on our hearts, because that's the only thing of any eternal significance whatsoever. Would you please bless this time of, of teaching and learning and leading this morning for your glory. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> so, about in the mid-80s, when cable channels just kind of exploded and we had so many more channels to choose from, marketing people came up with something that we kind of have a love-hate relationship with, and that is infomercials. Anybody ever watched an infomercial all the way through? Yeah, you don't want to admit it, but you kind of love them, don't you, Caleb? You kind of love infomercials, and the ones that you love are the ones where the inventor of whatever product it is really puts himself on the line in order to sell the product. I mean, maybe it's a guy who's developed some kind of cleaning solution, and so he, he pours red Kool-Aid all over a white couch and then cleans it. And that's pretty good, but even better are the ones who put themselves personally on the line in order to sell their product. You remember the guy that invented Crazy Glue? Where he glued a construction helmet to a, a beam and then suspended himself uh, over what probably turned out to be like a foot and a half of mattress. But from the, the way the picture was taken, it looked like he was like way up in the air. And you thought, okay, that's pretty cool because he is trusting his, his body to this product that he invented. And then you had the guy that invented flex tape. You remember him? 
He was the one who said, I saw this boat in half. And then he taped it together. And then he went out for, for a, a run on the lake and showed how the boat stayed together because of this waterproof flex tape. And you're going, okay, he's willing to put himself out on the line for the sake of his product. So that guy was pretty cool. But I got to tell you, the gold medal winner for infomercials is a guy named Steve Gass. Steve Gass is, in 1999, he was a patent attorney with a doctorate in physics and an amateur woodworker. And Steve Gass noticed that up to 6,000 people a day, were, or 6,000 people a year, about 10 a day, were losing fingers to table saws. And so he decided, he thought he could invent a saw that as soon as it came into contact with human flesh, the saw would immediately break and stop and drop below the surface of the table. And so he invented what he called the saw stop, and he tested it with hot dogs. And sure enough, every time it came into contact with a hot dog, the saw would stop and drop beneath the table. But that wasn't enough for Steve Gass. And it wasn't enough for the, the infomercials. He knew that in order to sell his product, he had to put his own finger into the saw. And so I had a video. And last week when I had a bunch of guys over at our house for Disciple Now, I was talking to the guys about this. And I said, now this may be a little bit extreme. What do you think? And, and Caleb and the other guys in our house were like, do it, do it, do it. And then I showed it to my wife. And she's like, I will leave the room. You cannot. So it'll be on the blog later. Um, but sure enough, I mean, that's what he did. And so now if you see Steve Gass at trade shows, you can go up and give him a high four and, and <laughs> congratulate him. No, I'm just kidding. It worked. It worked. But the amazing thing and what sells the product is when the inventor, when the creator of the product puts himself on the line. It's where we get the phrase, when you've got skin in the game, you stay in the game. It shows a commitment to your creation where you are willing to put your own life on the line for the sake of your creation. And that's what Jesus did. In Luke chapter 9, verse 51, we see this phrase, as the time approached for Jesus to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Now, I read in the New International Version, the English Standard Version says he set his face for Jerusalem. The New American Standard, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. I like the New King James Version here. It says he, res he steadfastly set his face for Jerusalem. Now, this idiom, this expression about somebody setting their face towards a goal, towards something, had been in use for hundreds of years before Luke wrote his gospel. In Isaiah chapter 50, verse 7, which we're going to go back to uh, at the end of this message, uh, you see uh, Isaiah writing this. He says, because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, have I set my face like flint. And I know I will not be ashamed. Set his face like flint towards a goal. Now we know the rest of the story. We know that Jesus was going to Jerusalem to die on a cross. And Jesus' disciples knew it too because just a, a few verses before this in Luke 9.22, Jesus told his disciples, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And so Jesus had no illusions about what he was going to Jerusalem to do. Jesus knew from the very beginning how things were going to end up, and yet that didn't stop him. The Bible says he resolutely set his face towards Jerusalem. 
And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning. God's word says that Jesus sent messengers on ahead who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him. Why? Because he'd set his face towards Jerusalem or because he was heading towards Jerusalem. And so you see right away that the decision was costly for Jesus. Samaritans and Jews, we know, didn't get along with each other very well. And so when the Samaritans, who believed that you could worship on Mount Gerizim, uh, saw this group of Jews that was heading to Jerusalem, who believed that that was the place to, to worship God, they refused hospitality to Jesus. Now, can you imagine how Jesus, how, how this must have stung to Jesus? Jesus knows that he's about to give up his life for the sake of all nations, Jews and Gentiles alike. And we know that he's been rejected by the Jews and he's going to be rejected even more. And now he's being rejected by the Samaritans, ones that he came to save. He knew the, tor that the, he knew the torture that he was going to suffer at the hands of his own people. And then when the Samaritans get wind of his destination, they reject him too. And so maybe James and John saw the, the pain and the hurt on Jesus' face when Jesus was rejected by some of these that he came to save. And so they think they're going to help out. When the disciples saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? They're like, yeah. We're going to see some Old Testament smiting here. And Jesus just rebuked them. And they went on to another, another village. We don't know exactly what Jesus said to the disciples at this time. But we know that that wasn't his mission. This wasn't the time for smiting. This wasn't the time for judgment. Jesus, by this point in his ministry, wasn't going to let anything sidetrack him from his ultimate goal. And so he just moved on. Now let's pause for just a minute and think about the impact of single-minded focus. How many of y'all have been watching the Olympics this week? Did anybody watch curling? Did anybody even know that was a thing? Yeah, so curling is kind of like shuffleboard on ice, and at which, yeah, it's a sport. And the Russians actually got you know, accused of blood doping for shuffleboard on ice. I don't get it. But... So the thing with curling is you've got this one guy who's got a, a big, it looks like an oversized hockey puck, and, and he pushes it down the ice, and then you have these two other guys that are sweepers that like make a path for it, and the goal is to get it into this circle. And as I was watching curling, and by the way, the United States won gold in curling. USA, USA, I mean, right? Yeah, so the United States wins gold in curling, and I am convinced it is because of this guy. I mean, you want to talk about single-minded focus. When he pushed that stone, he is just laser-beamed onto the target in the very, at the very end of the shuffleboard rink, or whatever you call it. And it's that kind of focus that won the medal. And I believe that when Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem, this was the kind of focus that he had. You remember that verse from Isaiah? He set his face like flint towards his end goal, towards that target. And there was nothing that was going to stand in the way of that. So I think that's probably what Jesus' face might have looked like on the way to Jerusalem which really puts the next three guys in perspective. Because Jesus, in the next few verses, meets three guys that are like wannabe disciples. And let's look at how Jesus responded to each of them. The first one we're going to call the bandwagon disciple. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I'll follow you wherever you go. Now, this is the only guy of the three that approached Jesus and said, I will follow you. Jesus replied, foxes have dens, birds, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Now, after Jesus gives this response, we don't hear from him again. 
I wonder what happened. Maybe Jesus said, hey, look, I don't know if you were paying attention, but we just got rejected by Samaritans. I mean, you're all excited about following me wherever I go, but I just had my credit card denied at the Samaritan Motel 6. Do you really want to go there with me? And I think the truth is, a lot of bandwagon wannabe disciples, they're in it for the good times. They're in it for the parade. They're in it for the, the feel-goodness of American Southern Christianity where it's culturally respectable to be on the, the church bandwagon. I mean, we live in a culture where nobody looks at you sideways if you go to church on Sundays or Wednesdays. They might look at you a little crossways if you take it too far if you get really serious about your faith. But for the most part, in the United States, it's very comfortable to be a Christian. But what about, what it, what about when it isn't? What about when following Jesus is inconvenient? What about when following Jesus gets in the way of your priorities and your plans? How often... And how tempting is it to, to jump off the bandwagon? Young pastor tells about reading the comment cards that were put in the offering plate on a Sunday. And he came across one that said, I don't like your sermons. And the guy signed it. So, you know, props for that. Props for, for signing the card. And by the way, if you don't like my sermons, let me know. But sign your name to it so we can talk about it. And that's what this guy did. He, he signed the card, he put down his name and phone number, and so the pastor called the guy. And he said, hey, I, I saw your comment card. I understand you, you don't like my sermons. Tell me what it is that you don't like. And the guy responded, I feel like you're trying to interfere with my life. <laughs> and so he wandered off the bandwagon. And he didn't come to church. And the fact is, Jesus has come to mess with our lives. And if you think anything different, then you're probably in the wrong place this morning. Jesus has come to interfere with our lives. But this guy, after Jesus said, look, I don't even know. I literally don't know where I'm going to lay my head tonight. The guy said, hmm, uh, Never mind. That's a bandwagon disciple. Let's look at the second wannabe disciple. You have a bandwagon disciple. Number two, you have a foot dragon disciple. Jesus said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. You go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Now this seems really harsh, doesn't it? Is Jesus, is Jesus saying it's okay to forsake family obligations? No. In fact, Jesus made it clear in his teaching that taking care of your parents is a priority. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus gave a harsh rebuke to the, the Pharisees when the Pharisees were teaching that it was okay to take the money that you would have used to take care of your parents and dedicate it to the, king, to the, the temple. Jesus said, no, when you do that, you are no longer doing anything for your father or mother. So Jesus is not saying it's okay to neglect your parents. But the truth is, when this guy said, let me go and bury my father, the truth is his father wasn't even sick yet. See, in the ancient Near East, when somebody died, you were expected to bury them before sundown. So if this guy is out hearing Jesus' teachings, his father isn't dead, his father's not even sick. And so he's not saying, let me take care of this family obligation. He's saying, let me delay because there's some things that I want to do first before I get serious with you. Let's remember that Jesus has supernatural insight into human beings. John 2.25 says that Jesus knew what was in the heart of a man. And so Jesus knew that this guy would always have an I'll follow you but first attitude. What about you? Are you a foot dragon disciple? I'll get serious with you, Jesus, but first, let me get out of high school. 
Because if I become this Jesus freak in high school, people might make fun of me. I'll follow you, Jesus, but first, let me, let me get my nest egg in order. Because all this talk about tithes and offerings, have you seen my budget? Have you seen my mortgage? I'll follow you, Jesus, but first, let me get this taken care of. Let me get out of debt. Let me get my kids out of the house, and then we'll get serious about following you. How often do we have a I'll follow you, but first attitude? And Jesus doesn't want to be second to any other agenda. Jesus doesn't want to be second to any other life plan. God says in Isaiah, I will not share my glory with another. So we can't be a foot dragon disciple. We can't be a bandwagon disciple. Number three, we can't be a sidetracking disciple. Still another said, I'll follow you, Lord, but first... There's that word again, but. Yes, but. First, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is, temp is fit for service in the kingdom of God. And again, you're tempted to say, wow, this is super harsh. What's so bad about saying bye to mom and them? And if you've been listening in on that conversation that day, you, as a, a, a Jew, would have remembered 1 Kings 19, the story of Elijah and Elisha. Prophet Elijah is looking for a successor, and so he goes to Elisha. This is in 1 Kings chapter 19. You can, it'll be up on the screen. He goes to Elisha and uh, finds, finds Elisha, son of Shaphat, in verse 19. Elisha was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him and threw his cloak around him. That was his way of saying, hey, I want you to take the mantle of the prophet. So he picked him to, to be the, his successor. And it says in verse 20, Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I will come with you. So maybe you've got that story in mind on this day when you hear Jesus. And you're thinking, okay, what's different between what I'm saying and what Elisha said in the Old Testament? But I want you to notice what happens next in Elisha's story. The prophet Elijah says, go back, Elijah replied, what have I done to you? So Elisha left him and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment to cook the meat. He gave it to the people and they ate. Then he set out to follow, to follow Elijah and became his servant. Do you see what Elisha does here? He's a farmer, and he's a prosperous farmer at that. Uh, it wasn't just anybody in the ancient Near East who had 12 yoke of oxen with which to plow his field. So Elisha is prosperous with this. But the moment that God calls him, he takes his plowing equipment, he chops it up into kindling wood, he takes all 12, he, he takes all 12 yoke, that's 24 oxen. He takes all 24 oxen and he slaughters them all. And he cooks the meat and he feeds a barbecue to all of his friends and all of his neighbors. And then he's got nothing left to go back to. And he follows Elijah wholeheartedly. Think about that. So when Jesus hears this, this wannabe disciple saying, let me go back and say goodbye to my family, again, supernatural insight into this man. And he knows this is not the same commitment that Elisha had. This is the kind of person who gets sidetracked by lesser concerns. What would that be for you? What is it that... that causes us to look to the side at other priorities? What is it that causes us to look back on other obligations that keeps us from being all in with Jesus? Maybe it's family relationships, job responsibilities. Maybe it's regrets over our past. Jesus says, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Maybe it's not so much uh, 
things that we want to do looking ahead, but sometimes the thing that keeps us from following God wholeheartedly is looking back on things in our past with regret to where we say, I'm not qualified. I messed up too many times. And Jesus' response is, you're right, you're not qualified. Nobody is. But I died to make you qualified. I died to make you sanctified. I rose again to make you justified. And I want you to serve me with no qualifications. So Jesus says anyone who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. If you look back, you can't plow in a straight line. You look back and you get sidetracked. 1519, Spanish explorer and conquistador Hernando Cortez decided that he and his army would conquer the Aztec Empire. There have been legends of all of the Aztec gold. And so they landed on the Yucatan Peninsula with 500 soldiers and 100 sailors and 11 ships. But despite that large army, he was still vastly outnumbered by the Aztec Empire that had been around for 600 years. And so a few of his soldiers said, we can't do this. This is, the, the, the foe is too large, the enemy is too great, the challenge is too daunting. And so they made a plan that they were going to steal the ships and sail to Cuba that was friendly with Spain. But when Cortez heard about the plot, he burned the ships because he didn't want there to be anything that could keep them from the goal. He burned every other option so that they could only be focused on what was ahead. And I wonder, for us this morning, are we holding on to other options? Are we holding on to Jesus and? Are we holding on to I'll follow you but? Are we all in with Jesus it's a costly commitment. And we're tempted to interpret Jesus' words to take the, the cost out of the words. John Piper says, you can't do that. You can't look at passages like this and say, well, Jesus didn't literally mean let the dead bury their own dead, you come and follow me. Jesus didn't literally mean you can't go and say goodbye to your mother and father. But what if Jesus did? We know in Luke 14, Jesus said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. We want to back off of how radical that sounds. We want to reinterpret and we want to sugarcoat. And we want to say, well, Jesus couldn't have meant that. John Piper said this, he said, whatever you do, don't domesticate the radical teachings of Jesus. If they make you uncomfortable, let them do their work. They are designed to create real disciples who are ready to lose all to gain Christ. The world may call it hate, they may call it foolishness. It is not, it is love, and it is the wisdom of God. God's word stands on its own. And we dare not reinterpret it in a way that makes us more comfortable. God's word is supposed to make us uncomfortable. It's supposed to challenge us. And here's the thing. We follow a savior who gave his all for us. You got to realize that Jesus didn't ask his disciples to do anything that Jesus did not willingly, joyfully do himself. You remember Steve Gass saw stop? He put his own finger into the teeth of the buzzsaw in order to demonstrate that his product was worth buying. And in the same way, Jesus put his own life into the buzzsaw of humanity in order to show that they could be saved. 
earlier I showed you Isaiah chapter 5 through 7 and I just showed you verse 7 because the sovereign Lord helps me I will not be disgraced therefore have I set my face like flint and I know I will not be put to shame let's look at the whole passage Isaiah writing some 600 years before the birth of Christ knew that Jesus was going to set his face like flint towards Jerusalem. He knew that the sovereign Lord was going to throw himself into the teeth of his creation and that his own creation would mock him, would spit on him, would pull out his beard in fistfuls, would beat him to within an inch of his life. So he writes, the sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I've set my face like flint, and I know I will not be put to shame. They put a heavy crossbeam on his bloody shoulders and marched him through Jerusalem to a hill called Calvary. And they crucified him there, subjecting Jesus to the most shameful form of execution that they had yet come up with. But Jesus was not put to shame. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says that Jesus for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising its shame, and now sits at the right hand of God. What was the joy that was set before Jesus? It was a relationship with us. It was a restoration of that relationship that was broken in the Garden of Eden when sin entered the world. God made a plan for his creation to be restored to him again. And that plan involved Jesus putting his own life into the buzzsaw for your sake and for my sake. Yes, Jesus demands a costly commitment from us, but Jesus made the ultimate commitment for us on the way to Jerusalem. In 1904, William Borden was a rich Chicago high school graduate. Maybe you've heard of the Borden family. Borden Dairies, Borden Milk, it's those Bordens. And so William Borden graduated from high school in 1904 and his parents for a graduation present gave him a gap year trip around the world. And as Borden was traveling around the world through Asia, the Middle East, Europe, he felt a growing burden for the world's hurting people. And so Bill Borden, heir to the Borden Dairy fortune, wrote home and said, I feel like God is calling me to be a missionary. His friends and family couldn't believe that he was throwing away all of this fortune, all of these riches in order to be a missionary. And so Borden took his Bible, and in the back of his Bible, he wrote two words, no reserves. I'm not going to hold anything back. Borden went to Yale University, and at Yale, he was exposed to all of the temptations that any college student would be. The party scene in 1904 was probably very much like the party scene today. And the temptation to get distracted and sidetracked by philosophy and, and intellectualism was just as strong in 1904 as it is today. And Borden, instead of giving in to those temptations, Borden wrote this in his journal. Simple phrase, no to self. No to self. During his first semester at Yale, Borden started a freshman Bible study with just one other guy in his dorm. 
They would meet in the morning. They would pray together before breakfast. They would read scripture. Borden would share what he felt like God was teaching him through the scripture. And that group of two grew into a group of three, which grew into a group of six, which by the end of his freshman year grew to 150 freshmen meeting every week for Bible study and prayer. And by the time Borden was a senior at Yale, that group of 150 had grown into 1,000 out of Yale's 1,300 students meeting for Bible study, meeting for prayer. So when Borden graduated from Yale, many people thought, okay, he's gotten that missionary call out of his system. Now he's going to join the family business. Now he's going to become a dairy tycoon. He had tons of job offers all over the table. You don't want to work for your family business? That's fine. Here's this and this and this and this. Borden said no to all of them and enrolled in seminary at Princeton. People said, I can't believe you're doing this. Borden took out his Bible, and in the back of his Bible wrote two more words. No retreats. No retreats. God called me to this, and I'm not going to back down. Borden excelled at Princeton, and when he graduated, he sailed for China with the goal to reach Muslims in China. And on the way to China... Borden's plan was to stop in Egypt and spend several months in Egypt learning Arabic so that he could more effectively reach the Muslims in China. And while he was there, he contracted spinal meningitis. And within a month, William Borden was dead. And people, when they got the news back at home, people looked at this 25-year-old man, and they said, what a waste. He had the whole world in front of him, and he threw it away to reach Muslims in China. What a waste. When his Bible was returned back home, they found two more words that apparently he had written just before his death. No regrets. No regrets. It is a costly commitment. But when you follow Jesus, when you go all in and you don't put anything in reserve, you don't hold anything back, you say, it's a blank check, Lord, I give it all to you. No reserves. No to self. There's never going to be a yes, but statement in my life when it comes to following Jesus. No reserves, no to self, no retreat. When God calls you, he's not going to change his mind. And when you do that, there is no regret. Some of you may be on the fence. Some of you may be wondering, is it worth it? If I go all in with Jesus, the way you're talking about, Pastor, what if I lose? What if, what if I don't get everything that I want? What if I lose my job? What if I lose my friendships at school? What if I lose? You might lose your friends at school. You might lose your job. You might cause strain and stress in your marriage in the short term. In the short term. Because suddenly you're getting all serious about your faith and your spouse may not be there yet. No regrets. Those in this church that have been following Jesus for a long time, to a man, to a woman, they would say it is worth it. There is a peace that passes all understanding and it can guard your hearts and your minds today in Christ Jesus. It is a costly commitment. Make no mistake, but it is a commitment with which there are no regrets, no retreat, no to self, and no reserves. Would you pray with me? Father God, as we follow you on the way to Jerusalem, I thank you for the 
costly commitment that you made for us. And Lord Jesus, if there is anybody here that has not made that commitment to you, I pray, Father, that you would not let them rest. Father, that you would put something in their spirit right now that is just restless because they know that they need to make things right with you. Help people to be reminded of the love that you have for them, the love that took you to the cross, the love that took you to Jerusalem with no regrets and no looking back. And Lord, let us offer our lives to you in the same way. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing a, time, a hymn of invitation if God is speaking to you.